Hello, today we are here with Ambassador Terence McCulley. He is a senior visiting expert at the United States Institute of Peace. Welcome. Thank you. He has worked for more than three decades in the Foreign Service for the United States, much of that on the African continent. Last month, we saw that the Biden administration announced their 10-year plans for their strategies to uh, prevent conflict and promote stability. And that was in nine countries, including five in coastal West Africa. Right. And we also saw VP Harris. She went to Ghana and announced for the coastal West African states a $100 million pledge. And these, state, these countries are Benin, Ghana, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and Togo. We understand that this is a part of a strategic effort by the United States to, in part, look at these countries as um, strong partners, as part of the U.S.-Africa renewed partnerships but also out of concern for some of these countries and the violent extremist threats that are emerging from the Sahel. Could you tell us a little bit more about the state of violent extremism in recent years emerging from the Sahel? You know, the, the violence from the Sahel um, is, is not new. Um, when I was ambassador to Mali, uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb um, uh, was active in the, in the north of Mali. Uh, but in the last 15 years, we've seen an explosion of, of terrorism and violent extremism across the Sahel. And the U.S. put in place a, a variety of policies to try to build uh, the capacity of, of uh, governments in the Sahel to resist this uh, expansion of extremism. Uh, I think the, the current focus is, is looking, it really c comes from concerns that, that violence from the Sahel is spilling over into coastal West Africa. You have porous borders, you have lack of capacity uh, in host uh, country security forces, uh, and it really is a, it intended to be a, a whole of government effort to, to address uh, violent attacks coming from the Sahel and affecting the northern regions of uh, particularly Benin, Togo, uh, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire in, in the last two years. And how would you see this, these new strategies, this new approach as, as being different from other stabilization approaches, other counterterrorism, stability, CVE approaches? How is this a retooling? Sure. Well, I, I think it's frankly a recognition that uh, much of the, the resources that we deploy, the effort that the United States and uh, other countries uh, uh, deployed in the Sahel from the early 2000s, to counter the growing threat of violent extremism really didn't work. Uh, you had the pan Sahel Initiative, you had the uh, trans saharan Counterterrorism Partnership. All of these were intended to be a, a whole of government approach using the three pillars of democracy development and, and defense to build capacity in uh, these countries in the Sahel to resist the, uh, the threat of, of violent extremism. I think the reality is that, that it didn't work. Uh, and and frankly, most of these programs uh, turned into a train and equip, um, which uh, provided training to host country militaries, provided equipment. And as we saw in, in Mali in, in 2012, when um, after the fall of Muammar Gaddafi in, in Libya and uh, the extremist groups increased from 200 uh, to more than 3,000 men, um, that the support that we had provided to the Malian military in this case uh, was not effective. Um, uh, and so I, I think the current, uh, the current plan, the current uh, strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, which comes from the Global Fragility Act, was a recognition that we had not been as successful as we had hoped to be uh, and that we needed to look at things differently. Uh, and, and that's the program that Vice President uh, Harris announced in, in, in Accra recently. And it's five countries. It's, it's an ambitious effort, you know, and they're, they're five different countries, diverse countries. And, and, you know, just it's Benin, Ghana, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and Togo. And for this effort, $100 million, um, how do you see any challenges or any, uh, any issues with working? What, what, what will they be up against in trying to implement this strategy? Well, the, the really, Andrew, the, the biggest challenge is lack of resources. It, it is a significant sum of money, and it's a significant commitment by the United States government over 10 years to, uh, to uh, pivot and, and work in a different way to counter the threat. But when you divide that uh, among five countries, it's about $20 million a year. And so it can really only have a catalytic um, uh, effect. But it, it really is an, an effort to, uh, to refocus to, to look at, uh, at the governance issues, um, to look at uh, both 
at, at capacity of, of host country militaries, to look at um, how these militaries interact with civilian populations in a way that, that demonstrates that they are protectors and not oppressors and, and, and not um, violating human rights. Um, so it, it's really a, an, an effort, um, again, in my view, underfunded because it's only $20 million a year per country, um, but to, to look at, uh, at, at how the United States can, can both encourage host governments and also encourage like-minded governments to invest in uh, an area which uh, are, is increasingly at risk. And of course, you, you, you've just recently, last year, come off co-chairing the, the senior study group uh, here at the United States Institute of Peace, and you've looked into all these issues with the group. You brought together policymakers, experts, business leaders, mm -hmm. people from the region, academics, and really this, this really comprehensive look at, at the these five countries and, and, and the strategy. What were the big recommendations and findings that you found coming out of this study group last year? Well, to begin with, I, I think the study group recognized and agreed that at, at the heart of this new policy must be a, a focus on good governance. Governments demonstrate relevance to their, their, their populations by showing up, by demonstrating uh, commitment to provide clean water, uh, uh, health facilities, infrastructure, uh, programs that create jobs. And you need to do that by, by putting your boots on, on the ground. And so I, I think one of the key recommendations and one of the key elements of the policy is to demonstrate um, that governments in, in Abidjan, in, in Accra, in Lome, in, in Cotonou, uh, and, in, um, and in Conakry, um, in consonant with their national development plans, uh, focus really on, on, on investing in the resources on the ground to demonstrate that, that government is a benevolent force in their lives, that government can, um, can create opportunities uh, to counter both recruitment uh, and, to, uh, and, and to engage local populations in resisting this, this influx of extremism. Uh, one of the other recommendations really focused on the need for, for coordination. Because if we're, if we're really talking about a whole of government approach, you need to have great coordination among all of the implementing agencies in the field, as well as back in Washington. A third really concrete recommendation was the, the need for senior level ownership here in Washington. The Biden administration ha has said, we want to up our game uh, in Africa. We want to demonstrate that the United States um, uh, values the relationship across the board with the, with the 54 countries of Africa, the 49 countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and by doing that, you need to have constant policy engagement uh, led by somebody at the uh, undersecretary level here in, in Washington. The fourth element goes back to the point I, I mentioned earlier about resources. Historically, if you look at staffing across the African continent, um, African U.S. embassies in Africa are under-resourced and understaffed. Uh, and the five embassies uh, that we're talking about here are, are, are not spared from that. Two of them, I, I believe, don't even have a, or three of them, don't even have a, a USAID mission, which, which means that you, uh, you, you need to both empower ambassadors in the field to carry out this, uh, this new policy, but you need to provide them with, a, with the material resources, both monetary and human resources, to allow them to implement the, 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 the policy. So, uh, the fourth recommendation really, really spoke to the need to, uh, to ensure that chiefs of mission in the field um, had adequate resources to carry out what is, what is an important you know, part of U.S. foreign policy toward coastal West Africa. Thank you so much, Ambassador McCulley, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure. You.